Hi, welcome to this lecture on programming model. This is the first part of our two-part introduction to the Java programming language. Here is an outline for this lecture. We'll first talk about the basic structure of a Java program, and then we will discuss primitive data types and expressions. Then we'll talk about different statement forms in Java, such as if statement, for statement, and so on. Then we will discuss arrays, and then static methods, uh, and how to use and define static methods. And then we'll talk about the concept of an application programming interface, or API for short. And then we will discuss strings in Java, and finally conclude the lecture by talking about different forms of input and output. Now, when we write our Java programs, we are going to follow a particular workflow, right? We're going to write our Java programs using a very simple-minded editor uh, called BlueJ. Now, Java programs typically have a .java extension. So let's say we've used the BlueJ editor to write a Java program called p.java. The next step in the workflow then is to compile this program. And we do that by invoking the Java C program, which is the Java compiler. And if p.java is error free, then the compiler produces a file called p.class, right? That's the output of the compiler. And the next thing that we do in the workflow is we run uh, this file p.class. And the way we do that is by invoking the Java virtual machine or JVM for short, which is nothing but a program called Java. And uh, when we do that, uh, that is, when we invoke Java on p.class, we get the desired output of the program, all right? So that's the workflow that we're going to follow. Now, for us, a Java program is going to be either a library of static methods or functions, or it's going to be a data type definition. Now, in this lecture, we're going to focus on uh, writing Java programs as libraries of static methods, and in the following lecture, we will discuss data type definitions. To create a Java program, we use the seven programming constructs that are listed here. All right. Now, in this lecture, we're going to focus on the first six constructs, and we will save data abstraction for the following lecture. Now, let's start by looking at an example of a Java program. And the program that you see here is um, something that computes the factorial of a given number. All right, so this program is called factorial, and it takes an input number n, and it computes factorial of n. Now recall that factorial of n is simply 1 times 2 times 3 and so on, all the way up to n. So for example, if n is 5, uh, 5 factorial is 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times 5, which is 120. And zero factorial, by definition, is one. So let's now walk through this program. The very first line that you see here is what we call the import statement. Right? And the import keyword is what you use to import a particular library. So in this case, we are importing the library std out from this package. All right. And the reason we do that is because later on in the program, we use some functionality from this library std out. Okay. So that's how you import libraries in Java using the import keyword. And then what follows in the program is the definition of a class called factorial. All right. Now everything in Java has to be defined inside of a class. And that's what we have here. We have a class called factorial that contains two functions one called factorial and the other one called main, All right? Now these two guys, public and class, are keywords. Class is what we use to uh, define a class, in this case, factorial. And public just means that this class is visible across files, not just within the file that contains this class definition, okay? Now, the next thing that follows is uh, what we call a comment. So anything that starts with two slashes is a comment in Java. And these uh, uh, and comments are ignored by the compiler. Their purpose is just for readability, right? It's basically for human consumption. So now let's talk about the definition of the factorial function or method. So this is um, a method called factorial that takes an input, 
an integer n and it returns an integer all right um, and this method is declared to be uh, public and static um, now let's talk about how the method uh, is implemented so we define a variable called result of type integer and give it an initial value of one right now uh, uh, keep in mind that uh, java unlike languages like python and so on is a strongly uh, type language uh, and that means that every variable has to be declared before use right so you have to tell uh, the compiler what the types of different variables are right and that's what uh, we are doing here we're saying that result is a variable of type integer and um, and even here we're saying that this input parameter n is of type integer and then uh, and that the return value is of type integer right so uh, uh, we have to be um, careful about types in, in Java um, okay, so the next thing that follows is a for loop that basically implements the, the factorial uh, 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 function. Okay? So the way this for loop works is i starts out uh, with the value 1 and as long as i is less than or equal to n, we carry out this computation. So what are we doing here? Well, here we are saying take the old value of result, multiply it with the value of i, and store the new uh, 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 store that resulting value as the new value of result. Right. So this this line can also be read as result equals result times i. Okay. Um, and then once an iteration is complete, then i is incremented by one. And then this check is performed again. And if this condition is still true, then the body uh, is executed again. And then this update takes place. And then we do the check and so on and so on and so on. And the for loop is done when this condition turns out to be false, meaning i is greater than n. And in that case, we are out of the for loop and we end up returning result, and uh, which uh, uh, stores the factorial of n. Okay. So that's, that's how um, this function or method factorial works. Now let's look at the next method. So we have a comment again, and then the next method is called main, and um, it has this particular signature. It's public, static, void, meaning it re doesn't return a value, and it takes an argument or a parameter called args, which is an array. So an array is denoted by a set of square brackets, a one-dimensional array, and it is an array of uh, string objects, right? So that's what we have here. So this guy here, this string, um, specifies that this is an array of strings, right? Now, this method main with this particular signature has a very special status, okay? Um, so this uh, uh, method is called the entry point method in uh, Java. Meaning, when we run this program, it's this method that is invoked first. All right. So Java. Uh, so whenever you run a Java program, the JVM goes looking for a method that has exactly the signature: public, static, void, main, with a parameter that is an array of uh, strings. Right. And if it finds one, that's the method that is it's going to kick off. All right. Um, okay. So what are we doing in main? Well, in main, we are getting the first element of uh, this array, uh, just like in uh, other languages like Python, uh, arrays are uh, indexed starting at zero. Right? So we're getting the first uh, uh, value from this array, and that's a string as denoted by this guy here. And what we do is we take that string, uh, that's basically the input to this program, but the input to this program is, is a number I mean, because you know we are interested in calculating the factorial of a number so we don't we don't want this guy as a string we want to turn it into a number and the way we do that in java is using a function called parsent that sits inside of the integer library all right so this function would turn this string into an integer which we assign to a variable called n of type integer all right so so now this guy here n is uh, the, the input as an integer. 
So what are we doing next? Well, we make a call to our factorial function, giving it n as an argument, and this function ends up returning the factorial of this number, which we uh, combine along with this string and this number. So this whole thing is now a string that we print using the println method or function that is sitting inside of stdout library. All right. So here we're basically saying that the that n factorial n factorial equals the the, the value, right? The factorial of n. So let's see uh, uh, how we compile this. Well, that's very easy. So this program sits inside of a file called factorial.java. So we compile it by saying Java C factorial.java. And that ends up producing a file called factorial.class. And we run factorial.class by saying Java factorial. Note that when you run a Java program, you don't specify the extension, right? So we just say Java factorial, and we give it the input, the value of n, which in this case is five. And the program ends up printing uh, 120. Okay, so this output five exclamation equals 120 comes from here, right? So five exclamation equals 120, right? So that's our very first Java program. So now let's talk about uh, the constructs that make up this program in some detail, right? So the first thing that we uh, need to discuss is uh, the notion of primitive data types and expressions. Now a data type is defined as a set of values or a range of values and a set of allowed operations on those values. All right, so this is a very important definition to keep in mind. So a data type is nothing but a set of values and a set of allowed operations on those values. Now in Java, a data type can be primitive or it can be of reference or object type, right? So let's first uh, discuss primitive types. Now in Java, there are um, eight primitive types in all. Um, let's uh, first consider the, the four fundamental or basic primitive types, right? So these are Boolean, char, int, and double. Now Boolean um, is a primitive type whose values are just true and false, right? So just, just two possibilities, true and false, or one and zero, on or off, and so on. Um, now what are the allowed operations on Boolean values? Well, all the logical operations the logical not, the logical or, and logical and, right? So those are the allowed operations on the two Boolean values, true and false, okay? Now, char, int, and double, these are internally just numeric types, all right? And they only differ in terms of the, the range of values. So a char is 16-bit, and an integer is 32-bit, and a double is 64-bit, all right? But internally, they're just numerics. And what that means is that the allowed operations on a char, int, and double are all the arithmetic operations, plus, minus, multiplication, division, and remainder, all right? So you can, you can perform arithmetic operations on all these types. Uh, Okay, so, so, that's, so those are the four uh, basic types. And in addition, you have uh, the byte, short, float, and long primitive types. All right? Now these are also numerics. They only differ in terms of the range of values that are allowed. Um, and since they're internally numeric, the allowed operations on these are also all the arithmetic operations, meaning plus, minus, multiplication, division, and, uh, and remainder, right? So there are eight primitive types um, in Java, and here they are, and it's these guys that we're going to use quite extensively, right? Okay, so let's uh, talk about a few other things. Um, an expression uh, is a literal, it's a variable, or a sequence of allowed operations on literals and or variables that produce a value, all right? So, so 
any literal that you have in your program is an expression. So that's like the, the, the simplest kind of an expression. Right? So for example, the number 42 is a literal. Right? And it's an integer literal in particular. The number 3.14 is also a literal and that's a floating point literal. Right? And if you have a variable x of type integer, that by this definition is also uh, an expression. Right? Um, so literals are expressions, variables are also expressions. And then once you have these simpler expressions, you can combine them using the allowed operations on, on those guys right, to produce complex expressions. So let me give you a concrete example. So let's say we have you know, a, a floating point literal. Uh, so let's say we have a floating point literal 3.14, right? So by this definition, um, this guy is an expression. It's an expression of type uh, float. Now, let's also say that you have a variable x that is of type uh, double, right, or float. Um, so by this definition, since this guy is a variable, it's also an expression. Right? So this is an expression of type double, this is an expression of type double. Now what we can do is we can use any allowed operation on these guys. So for example, we can add these guys together and what we get is another expression, a complex expression, and this guy has a value. And what is the type of that value? Well, it is a double because both of these guys are double. Right? Um, so that's, that's uh, what we're saying here. Uh, what we're saying is that uh, the, the simplest kinds of expressions are literals and variables, and that you can combine these guys, these basic expressions, into complex expressions using the allowed operations. All right? Now, um, let's talk a little bit about uh, precedence. Arithmetic operators, multiplication and division, have a higher precedence than plus and minus. We all know that. Um, and among all the logical operators, not has the highest precedence, and that is followed by uh, and, logical and, and logical or. All right? Now, if you have two operands of the same type, they can be compared using what are called the relational operators. So you can check if two values are the same using the equals equals operator. You can check if they are not the same using the not equals operator and so on and so on and so on. All right. Um, so if you have two operands of the same type, you can compare them using uh, uh, the, uh, any of these relational operators. But uh, the, the thing to keep in mind is that the resulting expression has a Boolean value, all right? So for example, um, let's say you have two variables, uh, x and y, of uh, some type, let's say they're both integers. And if we want to check if x is strictly less than y, you would use the relational operator x less than y, all right? Now this guy is an expression of type integer, so is y and we have combined them using an allowed operation the relational operator less than so this whole thing is an expression but what is the the type of this expression well it's it's a boolean right so whenever you use a relational operator to compare two things the resulting expression has a a, a, a boolean type all right Now, relational operators have higher precedence than logical operators, but they have lower precedence than arithmetic operators. Now, if you have uh, operators of the same precedence, then they are evaluated left to right. Uh, <clears throat> for example, if you have an expression such as this, 2 star 7 divided by 5, 
then you know, since multiplication and division are both of uh, both have the same precedence, things are evaluated left to right. Right. So that's what we are saying here. And you can always use parentheses to uh, overwrite precedence rules. So for example, what that means is if you have something like 2 plus 7 times 3, because of the, the natural precedence rules, it's 7 times 3 that's going to be evaluated first. But what if you want the addition to happen first? Well, the way you overwrite the, the uh, the default precedence rules is by putting parentheses around right so when you do this it's this addition that's going to be carried out first so that's what we're saying here now numbers are automatically promoted to a more inclusive type if no information is lost right so an integer gets automatically pr uh, uh, promoted to a double okay because there is no loss in information in that case. Now, a cast is a type name that you put inside of parentheses within an expression, and it has the effect of converting the following value into a value of that type, okay? So for example, if you have a variable x, uh, let's say of uh, some type, we can cast it to uh, some other type by specifying the type inside of a parenthesis, right? So what this does is it converts the type of this fellow to this new type, provided that cast is allowed, all right? Okay, so now <clears throat> uh, that we know what expressions are, let's talk about statements. So what is a statement? So a statement is a construct that defines uh, a computation and um, a statement can either create variables, it can assign data type values to them, or it can control the flow of execution within a program. All right? That's what statements do. They, they basically define computation. Okay? Um, there are different statement forms uh, in Java and we are going to look at a few of them. Let's start with a declaration statement. A declaration statement is uh, the one that associates a variable name with a type. So this is the statement form that you use to declare a variable of a certain uh, type, right? And the syntax is extremely straightforward. You specify the type, and then you specify the name of the variable and semicolon. So this is now a statement. It's a declaration statement that declares a variable with this name and of this type. All right. Um, now, when you do something like this, a, a, a question um, that arises is that what is the default value of this variable? All right. Well, that depends on the type. So if the type is Boolean, then the default value of this variable is false. And if this is a numeric type, then the default value uh, is zero. So for example, if this is an int, then the default variable of this variable is zero, okay? Um, but what when this type is a reference type, right? We're going to talk about reference types uh, later on, but when this guy is a reference type, in that case, this variable takes on a default value of null, all right? So, so this is quite important, so keep this in mind. Um, so the default uh, value for this variable is dictated by the type. If the type is Boolean, it's uh, false. If the type is numeric, it's zero, and if the type is reference, it's null. Now let's talk about the assignment statement. So once you have declared a variable, how do you assign a value to it, right? Other than the default value. Well, the way you do that is using the assignment statement. And here again, the syntax is extremely straightforward. You put the name of the variable, and then the equal sign followed by an expression and semicolon, and it's the expression that specifies the value that you want. All right. Now, notice that this can be an arbitrary expression. It can be a simple expression, such as a literal or a variable, or it can be a compound expression that you build from simpler ones using the allowed operations. All right. 
all that you have to guarantee is that the type of this expression is the same as the type of this variable. All right. If the types don't match, then of course it is a compile time error. Okay. Now you can combine declaration and assignment statements um, using this syntax here. So you don't have to do it in two steps. You don't have to first declare the variable and then assign a value. You can just do it in one shot. All right. And the way you do that is by putting the type name, the name of the variable, the equal sign, the expression, and semicolon. Right? So here in one shot, what, you, what you've done is you've created a variable with this name and of this type and with this value. Okay. All right. So now let's talk about uh, a very important um, uh, statement form, which is uh, the conditional statement. Right? And uh, the, uh, a conditional statement belongs to a category of statements called the control flow statements. All right. So you use a conditional statement when you want to perform different actions for different inputs. All right. Um, so an if statement is an example of a conditional statement. All right. And let's um, first look at the syntax of the if statement in Java. So this is the most general syntax for the if statement. You specify the keyword if, and then you specify a Boolean expression in parenthesis, followed by a block of statements. A block in Java is denoted by curly brackets, right? And here you can have any number of statements, and any valid statement can uh, Java statement can go in here, right? So you have if a Boolean expression in parenthesis and a block of statements, and then you have the keywords else if a Boolean expression again in parenthesis followed by a block of statements and so on and so on and so on. You can have any number of these else if clauses and then at the end you can have an optional else clause which says else uh, and a block of statements. Okay, So that's basically the syntax of um, an if statement in Java. So how does this behave at runtime? What's the, the semantics? Well this is how it works. The Boolean expression is evaluated first and if it turns out to be true, then the statements in this block are all executed in sequence, one after the other. All right? And if this expression is false, then it's this Boolean expression that is evaluated. And if that happens to be true, all these statements are evaluated in order. Right? And once those statements are done, you're simply out of the if statement. Uh, even here, if this were true, all these statements are executed and you're out. But if this is not true, this guy is tested. If that is true, all these guys are executed and you're out of the if statement. All right. But what if none of these Boolean expressions are true? In that case, if there is an else clause, it's those, uh, it's the statements that are part of the else block that get evaluated, all right, unconditionally. So that's how an if statement works. Let's consider another, uh, 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 a control flow construct, which is called the conditional operator. Now, I should say that conditional operator is really an expression. It's not a statement. Okay, but it's it's typically used uh, uh, for control flow. All right. So how does this work? So here's the syntax. You have a Boolean expression followed by question mark, followed by an expression colon and an expression. All right. So that's the syntax for the conditional operator. Now this whole expression, again, remember this is an expression. So this whole expression evaluates to either this expression or this expression, depending on the truth value of the Boolean expression, all right? So for example, if this guy is true, then the entire expression evaluates to this guy. Whereas this, if this expression is false, the whole expression evaluates to this expression. All right. Now, in terms of type, this guy, of course, has to be of type Boolean. And these two expressions can be of any type, but they have to agree. So whatever the type of this guy is, must also be the type of this fellow here. All right. So, so that's um, the conditional operator. Um, and we'll see many examples uh, later on where we make use of this uh, operator. So, uh, yeah. 
Okay, so let's move on. Um, and uh, the next uh, 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 conditional statement that we're going to look at is the switch case statement, right? Um, so at times, the switch statement comes in very handy. Uh, it's sort of like the natural construct to use in, in some uh, uh, scenarios. So the way it works is you have the keyword switch followed by an expression in parenthesis followed by this block that contains a whole bunch of uh, cases and an optional default uh, clause, right? And the way this works is as uh, uh, follows. So if the value of this expression at runtime matches this value that's part of this case, then all these statements get executed in sequence. All right, um, but if this expression's value doesn't match this guy, but it matches this one here, then it's these statements that get executed and so on and so on and so on, right? But if the value of this guy doesn't match any of the cases, in that case, if there is a default clause, then it's these statements that get executed and you're outside of the, the uh, switch statement, all right? Um, so that's how the switch statement works. Now I should say something here, which is that typically the last statement that you have for each case is a break statement that I'm going to be talking about later. All right. So if you have a break as the last statement in every case, then whenever the statements in a particular case are executed, um, then once you hit the break, you're immediately out of the switch statement. Right? But inside of a case, let's say uh, inside of this case here, you don't have a break at the, the very end as the last statement. Then what happens if this expression's value turns out to be the same as this value? Well, all these statements are going to be executed. And since there was no break at the end, you have a fall through effect and all these statements are executed regardless of what this value is. All right? So, um, so you have to be aware of that uh, um, side effect, right? So uh, when you have a break as the last statement in a case and when you don't have a break, right? Okay, so now let's talk about another type of a control flow statement, which is a loop statement. Right? So a loop statement is what you use for repetitive uh, computations. So whenever you want to perform a set of actions many, many times, then you use a loop construct. So we're going to consider several loop constructs in Java. So let's first look at the while statement. So the while statement has this syntax. You have the keyword while, followed by the Boolean expression in parenthesis, followed by a block of valid Java statements. So that's the syntax. And the way the while statement works is as follows. The Boolean expression is evaluated first. And if it turns out to be true, all these statements are evaluated in sequence, right? And then the next thing that happens is that the Boolean expression is evaluated again. And if it is still true, these statements are executed once more. So these statements get executed as long as this expression turns out to be true. Okay, and you're out of the, the while statement when the expression uh, evaluates to false. All right, so, so whenever you have a while statement, typically in the body of the while uh, 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 statement, you have a statement that falsifies this Boolean expression at some point so that you break the loop and you continue with the rest of the program. Um, but that need not always be the case. You can you can have a while loop that that just goes on forever. All right. Uh, okay. Um, now here, you know, I should mention that if you have a while loop that says while true. And something, something, something. This is an infinite loop because true, which is a Boolean expression, is it's always true. Okay, so this while loop will never uh, stop. Okay, so this is an example of an infinite loop. So just keep that in mind. 
Let's talk about the next um, loop construct in Java, which is the for statement. So the way you write a for statement is as follows. You have the keyword for, and then in parentheses, you have three things. You have an initialization part, you have a Boolean expression, and you have an increment part, all right? So in here, what you do is you typically initialize what are called loop variables, right? And in here, you test the, the value of the loop variable typically against some uh, bound. Right? And in here, you update the loop variable. Okay? And then what you have is a body of the for statement, which is nothing but a block of valid Java statements. Right? So how does this for loop behave at runtime? Well, the initialization part happens first, so the loop variables get initialized, and then the Boolean expression is evaluated. And if this expression is true, then the statements get evaluated in sequence, the body of the for loop, and then it's the increment that takes place, right? And once the increment is done, the Boolean expression is evaluated again, and if it is still true, the body is executed once more. And then the increment, and then the Boolean expression again, if it is still true, the body is ex executed again, and so on and so on and so on. And the hope is that, uh, is that at some point, this Boolean expression becomes false, and you're out of the for loop, all right? Now here, um, there's something to keep in mind, which is that all these three um, parts are optional, right? So for example, it's perfectly okay to have a for statement that looks like this. For semicolon, so no initialization, semicolon, no Boolean expression, semicolon, no increment. Right? And then some body. Now, when you have something like this, it is also uh, an infinite loop. So this thing is absolutely equivalent to saying for semicolon true semicolon that. And which is equivalent to a while on a Boolean expression that's always true, okay? So all these guys are absolutely cool. All right. Okay, so now let's look at another loop construct, which is the do while statement. So here, the way you write it is, you first have the keyword do, and then you have a block of valid Java statements, and then the keyword while followed by Boolean expression in parenthesis and semicolon, right? So the way uh, do while works is as follows. The, the body gets executed first, and then the Boolean expression is evaluated. And if this evaluates to true, the body gets executed once more, okay? And if this uh, expression is still true, it gets executed once more, and so on, and so on, and so on. And it, 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 uh, and you're out of the loop when this Boolean expression evaluates to false. All right? Now, how is a do while different from while? Well, it's different in the sense that the body is executed at least once, right? Uh, because you you check on the Boolean expression after evaluating the body, so the body gets evaluated at least once. Right? So, and at times, you know, a, a do while statement, uh, uh, this is uh, sort of like a more natural construct uh, than a while statement, all right? So it depends on, on the problem that you're working on as to what construct you use, a do, a while, a while, or a for. Okay, let's talk about a few more um, uh, 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 statement forms. So the break statement is what you use to immediately exit a loop without letting it to run to completion. So if you want to like prematurely exit a loop, it's the break statement that, uh, that you use. And we're going to look at some examples later on. Um, and a break is also used uh, uh, along with switch statements. And I, I talked about this when we discussed the switch statement. Now, when you, used, when you use a break statement as the last statement in a switch case, uh, then you immediately exit the switch statement, preventing the fall through. 
right? But if you don't have the break as the last statement in the switch, then you have, you fall through to the following case, regardless of the value of that case. And this is exactly what I mentioned uh, before when I talked about the switch statement. Okay. All right, so that's a break statement. And then there's um, something called the continue statement. And that's sort of like the opposite of break. So the continue statement basically skips to the next iteration of, of uh, a loop um, without allowing the statements that follow the continue to be executed. All right? So if you have a continue statement and, uh, uh, and then a bunch of statements after it, uh, those statements are not going to be executed, but you just proceed with the next iteration of the loop. All right? we'll, we'll see some examples of this uh, later on. Um, okay. Now, um, a compound assignment statement is um, a shorthand form for modifying the value of a variable. So for example, you could say something like i plus equals 5, which is the same thing as saying i equals i plus 5. All right. So um, this is shorthand because it's just you know, four uh, characters, whereas this one is five, right? But they're both absolutely equivalent. And uh, the, the compound assignment is also avail available for other operators. So for example, um, I, so for example, I times equals three is the same thing as saying i equals i times 3. All right? So you also have the, uh, the, the compound assignment uh, uh, form for the other operators. OK, now the scope of a variable is the statements that immediately follow the declaration of that variable in the same block as the declaration. And remember that block uh, is basically marked by curly brackets in Java. So what does this mean? Um, so let's say you have a block denoted by these curly brackets and you define some variable here in x. So what is the scope of this variable? What are all the different places where it's visible? Well, it's visible uh, to the statements that immediately follow that declaration inside of that block, all right? So I can access x anywhere here within that block where x is defined, but I cannot access x here outside of the block. So if here I try to do something like print x, that is a mistake, okay? Because x here is out of scope, all right? So, so that's the, the idea behind the scope of a variable. Um, now, uh, when you have a for statement, so something like for int i equals zero, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you can talk about the scope of this variable i. What is its scope? Well, the scope of i is the body of the for statement. So if I try to access i here, then this is a mistake because i is out of scope here, right? i is only visible in the body of the for statement, right? So I hope well, that gives you an idea on, uh, about what uh, the scope of variable is. Okay. Now let's talk about um, arrays in Java. So an array is a collection, and an array in Java stores a sequence of values that are all of the same type. So unlike other languages like Python, uh, in Java, all the values in an array have to have the same type, right? Now making an array in Java involves three steps. You first declare the array, the array name, uh, and type. So that's the first step. And then you create the array. It's when you create the array that memory is allocated for that array, right? And then finally, you initialize the values in the array. So let's look at an example. So here, what we are doing is we are creating an array called A. That's the name of the array. And it's a one-dimensional array, okay? Uh, the fact that we use one set of square brackets means that this is a one-dimensional array. And it is an array of primitive ints, 
right? So this is basically a declaration statement that declares A to be an array of type int, right? So that's the first step in the, in, in, uh, the array uh, uh, creation process, right? You first declare the array. Now, when you declare an array, the initial value for that variable is null. So you uh, uh, keep that in mind because an array type is also like a reference type. So the default value in that case is a null, right? So the next step is to allocate some memory for the values uh, of the array. And the way you do that is by saying the array name equals new, which is a keyword. And then you repeat the type, which uh, integer in this case. And then in square brackets, you specify the size of the array. And in this case, it's 10 and semicolon. So this is basically the second step. This is where we are creating the array or allocating memory for this array. Right? So once uh, this line is executed, that's when you have some memory allocated for the array. Right? So at that stage, you have A pointing to an array of 10 elements, right? Index from 0 all the way up to 9. Now, um, you may ask, what are the values at this stage in these slots? Well, at this stage, the value in each of the slot is determined by the type of the array. So in this case, since it was an array of primitive type, all these values are initialized to zero. Because that's what we said earlier, right? When you have a numeric type, the, the default value is zero. Had this array been an array of booleans, all these values would have been false. And had this array been an array of uh, strings, uh, a string is an object type or a reference type, in that case, all these values would be nulls. Okay, but in this case, A is of uh, is an array of numeric type of of, of integers. Um, that's why all the values are initialized to zero. Right? Okay. So now let's say you know that's the uh, uh, we, we don't want that uh, uh, kind of an initialization. Instead, we want some kind of a custom initialization. Uh, so let's say we want uh, the, the zeroth element to be initialized to zero, first element to one, second element to two, and the ninth element to nine, right? How do you achieve that? Well, that's what we are doing in this for loop. So if you want some kind of an explicit initialization, you basically use a for loop, right? So what we are saying here is that uh, for i going from zero all the way up to 10, a at i equals i. So we simply initialize the ith value in the array a to the value of i. So once this is done, uh, the values in the array are going to be so the indices are 0, 1, 2, and so on, all the way up to 9. And the values are going to be 0, 1, 2, and so on, all the way up to 9. Right? because the ith value in the array A is simply i, right? So that's basically how you work with a one-dimensional array in Java. It's a three-step process. You first declare the array, and then you create the array, and then you perform an, uh, and you do an explicit, uh, explicit initialization if you need one, all right? Now keep in mind that you know based on an, uh, our earlier discussion, these two lines can be combined. So you can say you, know, uh, you, you can do the declaration and the creation part in one go. All right. So you can say in square brackets a equals new int and square brackets ten. All right. So you can you can do that in one line. Okay. Um, so. As I said before, when you declare an array, it is initialized to null. So at this stage, A has a value null. And then once created, once created, each element of the array is initialized to a default value based on the type of the array. So in this case, uh, it's uh, zero because it's an array of uh, primitive ints. Um, yeah, so that's what we are saying here, All right? Um, okay. Now, 
there is something called the initializing declaration that provides a sort of convenient way to uh, go about creating an array uh, with, a f uh, 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 with a small number of elements. Right? So let's say you know, we want to create an array uh, called A uh, that contains the first 10 Fibonacci numbers, which are 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, and so on. So every number is the sum of the previous two numbers. All right? So let's say we want you know, uh, an array A that stores the first 10 Fibonacci numbers. So in that case, you know, since it's just an array of, of 10 elements and we know exactly what those elements are, we don't have to go through the song and dance of you know, like declaring an, uh, an array and you know, creating it and initialization, uh, initializing it and so on. We can just do it in like one shot using this syntax. Right? So uh, we simply separate the values of the array inside of curly brackets right? using uh, commas. So we are saying A is a one-dimensional array of uh, type int, and the values are simply the first 10 Fibonacci numbers. Right? Uh, here's another example. Uh, we are creating an array called B, a one-dimensional array of type string, where all the values are the days of the week. Right? Here again, it makes perfect sen uh, sense to use this syntax because we know uh, what uh, uh, we only have seven elements here, and we know exactly what the values are. So there's no point in going through this uh, uh, tedious syntax. Right? So uh, the initializing uh, declaration syntax comes in very handy when you're working with arrays that have uh, uh, very few elements in them. Okay, now let's look at a concrete example where uh, we uh, do something uh, with an array, right? So here, what I'm showing you is the code that reverses an array A in place. So let's say we're given an array A that has um, a bunch of doubles uh, stored in it, right? Um, and we want to reverse it. For example, if the array A has elements 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, we want to turn it into an array that has uh, elements 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Right? So how do we reverse that array? And how do we do it in place, meaning without creating uh, an additional array? Well, here's the code that does it. So what we do first is we get the number of elements from the array, uh, in the array, and we can do that in Java by saying the array name dot length. So we store that value in a variable called n, and then we have a very simple for loop where i goes from 0 all the way up to n over 2, meaning it goes up to the halfway point of the array. All right? And what do we do with each element in the array? Well, we swap. So this is the swapping routine. We swap the element at i in the array with the element at n minus 1 minus i. All right? um, and I hope uh, you guys remember that uh, uh, from your experience having worked with um, a language like Python, that this is how you typically carry out a swap using a temporary variable, right? So you store the current value at i in 10, and then you assign the value in the array at n minus 1 minus i to uh, as the value at i, and then you assign the, the, the um, you assign temp as the value at n minus i minus uh, 1. But what is temp? Well, that was the old value uh, uh, in the array at the location i. So you're basically, so the end effect of these three statements is swapping the ith element with the n minus 1 minus ith element, right? And um, we do this as long as i is strictly less than n over 2, meaning i uh, 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 walks through the first half of the array, all right? And for each value of i, we swap uh, uh, the, the value in the array at i with uh, the value at n minus 1 minus i, okay? So it's a very interesting piece of code that um, reverses an array in place. Now, when you're working with arrays, you have to be careful about something called aliasing. So if you assign one array name to uh, another, then both refer to the same array, all right? And changing one has uh, uh, an effect on uh, the other. So what this means is if you have an array that points to this guy here, and if you have an array B that points to this guy here with a bunch of elements, bunch of elements, 
and then if you go about saying a equals b then what happens is a now points to what b uh, points to so okay and this pointer is gone so now a and b are basically pointing to the same array so if you change a or b you're basically affecting the same array right and this is what we call um, uh, aliasing and then what happens to this guy well there's nothing pointing to it so that's a bun bunch of memory uh, lost but fortunately for us java implements what is called garbage collection so this memory is eventually reclaimed and it is returned to you right okay now uh, let's talk about two-dimensional arrays so just like um, in a language like Python, a two-dimensional array in Java is simply an array of one-dimensional arrays. And a two-dimensional array can be ragged, meaning each row could have different number of columns. All right. So the, the, the memory representation for a two-dimensional array is as follows. Um, you have a one-dimensional array. So let's call it A. So that's simply a pointer to this one-dimensional array. And each element here is a one-dimensional array, all right? And so on. Okay, so a two-dimensional array is simply a one-dimension, is an array of one-dimensional arrays, all right? Um, Okay, and if you're working with a two-dimensional array, then the way you, you uh, uh, access the number of rows and columns is uh, uh, fairly straightforward since, uh, and, and that's because of this uh, kind of like a, a, a memory representation of a 2D array, right? So if you want to know the number of rows in A, you can simply say A dot length, right? Um, and why does that work? Because A is simply a one-dimensional array. So asking its length simply returns the number of rows in the two-dimensional array, right? So, uh, so that works very nicely. So the number of rows equals A dot length. But what if we want the number of columns? Well, let's assume that this is a, a not a ragged array, meaning every row has the same number of columns. Well, in that case, I can access the number of columns as the number of elements of any one of these arrays. But then, since the, uh, the uh, A is not ragged, each one of these arrays has the, the same number of elements. So I can simply go to any element of A, uh, and then corresponding to that is going to be a one-dimensional array and its length is going to give me the number of columns, okay? So I might as well just consult the zeroth element of A. So if I say A at zero, I am talking about this one-dimensional array and asking for its length gets me the number of columns, all right? Of, uh, gets me the number of elements of that array, but that is also the same as the number of uh, uh, columns of this 2D array because we said that the array is non-ragged, right? So that's basically how you would compute the, the number of rows and the number of columns of a 2D array that is non-ragged, right? If it is ragged, you just have to be a little careful when you compute the number of columns because that's good, that could be different for each uh, a row. In that case, instead of instead of uh, saying a at zero, you simply say a at i dot length. Okay, where i is the the row number. So this is for a non ragged two D array, and this is for a ragged. 2D array. All right? So that's how that's done. Now, just like one dimensional arrays, uh, even with 2D arrays, you have the initializing uh, declaration. So let's say you want to declare an array, uh, you want to uh, define an array called i that represents uh, uh, 
an identity matrix in three dimensions, right? So an identity matrix in three dimensions is simply 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. So you can very nicely, and since we know that it's a tiny, you know, it's a small array with just nine elements, and um, since we know all the elements in advance, we can simply use the initializing declaration to create it. And here's the syntax. So you have the name of the array, two sets of um, square brackets indicating that it's a 2D array or a matrix, and it's a matrix of type primitive int. And here is the syntax, right? So the curly bracket, and then inside of that, you have uh, the, the rows of the matrix. So this is the first row, this is the second row, and this is the second, uh, third row, right? Uh, so this is a one-dimensional array representing the first row of i, a one-dimensional array representing the second row of i, a one-dimensional array representing the third row of i. And each of the one-dimensional arrays separated by commas inside of curly brackets. So that's the syntax, right? Fairly straightforward. Okay, so let's now look at an example where we work with two-dimensional arrays, right? So here I'm showing you the code um, that does matrix multiplication. So let's say we are given two two-dimensional arrays or matrices A and B. A has M rows and P columns and B has P rows and N columns. And we want to multiply A and B to get the matrix C. Now, um, recall that you can multiply two matrices A and B only if the inner dimensions agree, meaning the number of columns of A um, has to be the same as the number of rows of B, uh, which in this case uh, they are. It's both uh, P. Right? So, so we can indeed multiply these two matrices and when you do so, the dimensions of the resulting matrix C is going to be M cross N. All right? Now how do we carry out the multiplication? Um, so the resulting matrix uh, has M rows and N columns and the element at row I and column J of that matrix is given by this formula. It is simply the dot product of the ith row of A and the jth column of B, right? So the element at ij in C can be calculated as the dot product of the ith row of A with the jth column of B, okay? That's what the summation indicates. So it's basically the dot product of uh, 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 the row I from A with the column J from uh, B. Right. And here's the code. We first uh, get the number of rows of uh, A by saying A dot length, so that's M. And then we get the number of rows of uh, B as, by saying B dot length, and we assign it to P. And then we get the number of columns of B by saying B at zero dot length. Okay, so this is what we talked about before. If you want to get the number of columns of a matrix, you simply say B at zero dot length, right? Okay, and then what do we do? And then we create a, uh, a, a two-dimensional array called C uh, with dimensions uh, uh, M and N, so M rows and N columns, right? Because that is uh, the uh, those are the dimensions of the resulting matrix. So that's what we're doing here. So notice that we are doing uh, uh, the we are declaring the array and creating it in one shot here. All right. So once this line is done, there is an array C created in memory with m rows and n columns, and all the elements are initialized to zero. All right. And then in this piece of code, we try to calculate the values of the matrix C. All right. So i goes from zero all the way up to m because C has M rows, and then for each such I, J goes from zero all the way up to N, because C has N columns, and the IJ element of C is calculated using this formula as uh, the old value of C at IJ plus A at IK times B at KJ, right? So this innermost for loop is what is calculating the dot product of the ith row of A with the jth column of B, right? Okay. Um, so 
so let's see we can uh, look at this as follows um, so you have your matrix C calculated as the matrix A times the matrix B so this guy here is A B and this is C we are looking at the ith row and the jth column so that's let's say this element here and that is calculated as the dot product of the ith row which is this guy here with the jth column of this matrix which is this slice here all right and that's what is going on in this inner for loop. So K simply runs through the elements of these guys and multiplies each one with the corresponding element from this column, adds them all together and assigns that as the value here, right? And then we repeat that for, uh, for all the other uh, values of I and J for the matrix C, okay? So that's how the matrix matrix multiplication works. Okay, so now let's talk about methods. So a method is what encapsulates a computation um, uh, defined as a sequence of statements, right? Um, so a method is nothing but a collection of statements. And we are first going to talk about what are called static methods. So a static method is uh, composed of the keywords public static so, they, uh, so static methods always uh, have the keyword static and uh, the, the keyword public if the, uh, the method is uh, supposed to be accessible outside of the, the uh, file where it is defined or the class where it is defined. Uh, and then the keywords uh, public static are followed by a return type or void if there is no return type. And then you have the signature of the method. Now the signature of the method comprises of its name and the sequence of arguments, each with a type, all right? And then um, after that, you have the body of the, the method, which is uh, just a sequence of uh, valid Java statements in, enclosed inside of curly brackets, all right? So a static method is simply the keywords public static uh, followed by a return type or void followed by the signature, which includes the name and the sequence of arguments along with their types, and then the body of the, the, the method, all right? So let's look at a quick example. So here, what we're looking at is a method called is prime. Uh, it is static, it is public, and it returns a Boolean value, and it has one parameter or one argument, which is called n, that's just a name, you can call it whatever you want, and its type is an integer. And what, what does this method do? Well, it simply tests if this method is, a, uh, if this uh, uh, argument n is prime or not. And it returns true if n is prime and false if it is not. So that's, um, uh, so that's the first line. And then what you have is the body of the method inside of curly brackets. And inside of the, the curly brackets, you simply have uh, statements, a sequence of statements, right? So how does this method work? Well, we first test using an if statement if n is less than two. If so, we return false because in that case, n is not a prime number. And when you return from a method, you're immediately out of the method, back to the caller, all right? But what if n is not less than two, meaning it is greater than or equal to two? Well, in that case, we go about testing if n is prime or not using this for loop. So i goes from two all the way up to uh, n over i. Um, and then in the body of the for statement, we check if i evenly divides n or not. So that's what this uh, 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 Boolean expression uh, uh, does, right? So if i evenly divides n, then this condition is going to be true. In that case, we again return false and we are out of the method because we have managed to find a number that evenly divides n, meaning n is not a prime number. So we are done, we are out of the method. But what if i does not divide n? Well, in that case, we continue. We go with the next value of i, and then we test again uh, uh, if i is uh, less than or equal to n over i, and if so, we test if i evenly divides n. 
uh, if so we return false otherwise we keep going right and we stop when i is strictly greater than n over i and notice that um, this condition this condition here can be um, also written as i um, I mean, if you take this i to the left hand side this is simply i square less than or equal to n which is the same as saying i less than or equal to square root of n okay but it turns out that this is a more efficient way of writing uh, uh, this code than using this we really don't want to compute the square root of a number and so on uh, because that involves calling a library method and that's uh, fairly inefficient so we really want to do it this way which is way more efficient right but they mean exactly the same thing right so as long as i is less than or equal to the square root of n we we uh, carry this step out meaning we test if i evenly divides n or not um, and once i is greater than square root of n we are out of the for loop and we end up here and return true because if we end here what does it mean it means that we have, we didn't find a proper divisor of of n which means n is a prime number so we return true to the caller right so that's that's how the method works uh, so hopefully that gives you a good idea on how um, uh, static methods are defined okay so that's how you define a method but how do you use such a method so a call on a static method is fairly straightforward it's simply the name of the method followed by the arguments specified in parentheses and separated by commas so for example if you want to call uh, if you want to test if the number 31 is prime or not you simply say uh, is prime which is the name of the method followed by the argument 31 and that of course is going to return uh, uh, true because 31 is a prime number All right so that's how you call uh, a static method um, now keep in mind that when you call a static method you um, typically also want to qualify it meaning you want to specify the name of the library that contains that method all right um, because if you're calling this method from another method that is defined inside of the same class then you don't need to qualify the, the, the method that you're calling but if the method belongs to another library than the one that you're calling it from then you do need to specify the name of the library so for example if you want to calculate the square root of a number from some program that you are writing you would say something like math dot square root of the number for example five so notice that here square root is a static method right but it sits inside of the math library uh, so you need to qualify uh, square root by saying that it is uh, you're calling it from the math library right so the way you call uh, a static method is always the the library name let's call it capital t followed by the period followed by the method name and then the arguments right so that's the way to call a static method okay so let's keep going now when a method call is part of an expression then the method computes a value and that value is basically used in place of the call in the expression all right um, so for example if you say something like you know double x equals math dot square root of uh, five so what you have here on the right hand side is, uh, uh, is, a, is a method call uh, with, which actually returns a value all right um, so that value is basically going to replace the call and that's the value that uh, gets assigned to x so that's what we are saying here so uh, uh, so 
In other words, when you have a method that returns a value, then a call to that method um, can be used as an expression. All right? And that's precisely what we have done here. OK, so um, here are some properties of methods in Java. Um, the arguments to a method are passed by value. And what that means is if the method goes about modifying those, are, uh, those values, they are not visible um, uh, 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 to the caller. Right? Um, now, method names can be overloaded, which means you, have, you can have several methods uh, that have the same name. Right? They only have to uh, differ in terms of the number of arguments in their types, but they can have the same name. That's overloading. Uh, now, a method uh, only has a single return value, but you, you can have any number of return statements. Uh, so, for example, here in this prime, we return from several places. We return from here, we return from here, and we return from here. But you return just one value. All right? And then a method need not always return a value. It can just have side effects. So for example, the println method from std out, it does not return a value, it, but it has side effects in that it prints uh, what, uh, the value that you give as an argument to the console or the terminal, all right? Now, a method that does not return a value uh, cannot be used as an expression, right? You can only use it as a statement for its side effect, right? So keep that in mind. Okay, now let's talk about a particular kind of method called a recursive method. Now, recursive method is uh, one that calls itself. Uh, it has um, what's called a base case, and it addresses subproblems that are smaller in some sense and does not address subproblems that overlap. So if a, a method meets all these conditions, then we say that it is a good recursive method. All right. So let's take an example of a, a, a good recursion. And the example that we're going to consider is the factorial uh, function. All right. Um, so recall that the factorial of n is simply n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 and so on all the way down to 2 and 1 all right and 0 factorial by definition is 1 now what can we tell about this part of the expression well, if n factorial is n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 and so on all the way down to 1, what is n minus 1 times n minus 2 and so on all the way down to 1? Well, that is precisely n minus 1 factorial. Okay, And thus, we have this definition here. So n factorial can be written as n times n minus 1 factorial. And that's the recursive step. Notice that the factorial function appears on both sides. Right? And then, and that is true precisely when n is greater than zero. And then when n is zero, we simply uh, 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 say that the factorial of zero is one, right? And this is what is called the base case. And this is the recursive case. All right. So if n is strictly greater than 1, then uh, n factorial is n times n minus 1 factorial. And when uh, n is 0, it is 1. All right. Once we have, and this is uh, what we call the, the recurrence relation or the recursive definition for the factorial function. And once we have something like this, it's very easily translated into code. All right. So here what we have is Java code that computes the factorial of a number. Um, and returns it uh, as a return value, right? So this function is called f, takes one argument n, and returns the factorial of n. And how are we implementing this, uh, this method, this recursive method? It's precisely what we have here. We first, uh, uh, so we say if n 
and we, we notice that we are making use of this conditional operator that we talked about uh, earlier right so we are returning a value which is either this or this but when do we decide between these two things well we decide based on the value of n all right so if n is 0 that's the base case we return this part we return 1 because 0 factorial is 1 so that's the base case but if n is not 0 then we return n times a recursive call to f on the input n minus 1 right that's the recursive step so if n is 0 we simply return 1 to the caller otherwise we return n times a recursive call to f on the input n minus 1 to the caller right now why do we say this is uh, this is a good recursion because it meets all these criteria it has a base case so, so this part is the base case it addresses pro sub problems that are smaller in some sense because notice that the recursive call is on a smaller input n minus 1 it's not n all right and then there is no overlap here with these sub problems all right so this is an example of a good recursion so let's actually trace this function for a small value of n namely 5 so what if someone calls f with the argument 5 so uh, since n is 5 we are not in, uh, at the base case yet because n is not 0 so in that case we simply make a recursive call to f on the input n minus 1 which is 4 right and when n is 4 we are still not at the base case so we make another recursive call uh, uh, to f with the input 3 still not the base case we have f of 2 still not the base case we have f of 1 still not the base case so we have f of 0 but now n is 0 so this condition is true so we simply return 1 to the caller but who called f of 0 it was f of 1 right so when f of 0 comes back what does f of 1 do it does n times f of 1 uh, n minus 1 well what was n here it was 1 so it's 1 times f of 0 which just came back with the value of 1 so that's 1 and that is returned to the caller of f of 1 but who called f of 1 it was f of 2 and what does f of 2 do when f of 1 returns well it simply returns n times so f of 2 simply returns n times f of uh, n minus 1 so this uh, uh, returns 2 the value of n times f of 1 which just came back with the value 1 which is 2 and this 2 is returned to the caller of f of 2 which was f of 3 and what does f of 3 do it returns 3 times f of 2 which just came back with 2 which is 6 to its caller which is f of 4 which returns 4 times f of 3 which just came back with the value 6 which is 24 to its caller which is f of 5 which returns 5 times f of 4 which just came back with the value 24 which is 120 and that's what is returned to the original caller right so, so that's how the, the recursion unfolds at uh, runtime let's now look at an, uh, an example of a bad recursive solution and the example that uh, we consider here is that uh, is uh, that of uh, uh, the nth fibonacci number so the way we calculate the nth fibonacci number is as the sum of the previous two fibonacci numbers so f of n is simply f of n minus 1 plus f of n minus 2 provided n is strictly greater than 1 and it is precisely 1 if n is 0 or n is 1 all right so um, so here's the table of Fibonacci numbers you have n and you have f of n when n is 0 f of n is 0 n is 1 sorry so you have f f of n 0 1 1 1 2 2 3 3 4 5 
6, 8, 7, 13, and so on. So the first two Fibonacci numbers are simply 1 and 1. And then every other Fibonacci number is obtained as the sum of the previous two Fibonacci numbers. All right. So this guy is the sum of these two. This is the sum of these two. 5 is the sum of these two, and so on, and so on, and so on. All right. So <clears throat> this is the recursive definition for the nth Fibonacci number. And once we have this, you can immediately translate it into Java code. So here we have a function called f that calculates the nth Fibonacci number and returns it as an integer. Um, and the implementation, again, makes use of the conditional operator. So we return either 1 or we return this guy here. And we return 1 precisely when n is 0 or n is 1. That's the base case. And we return f of n minus 1 plus f of n minus 2 when n is strictly greater than uh, 1. Right? That's the recursive part. So we are making a recursive call to f on n minus 1 um, and then adding that uh, to the recursive call to f on the input n minus 2. Right? Now, why is this a bad recursion? Um, well, uh, what condition, uh, what are, uh, which of the criteria does uh, this fail? Um, does it have a base case? It surely has a base case. So that's this part here. Right? Does it make uh, recursive calls on smaller inputs? Absolutely. So f is being called on n minus 1 on n minus 2. So no problem there. And it also ca correctly calculates the nth Fibonacci number. The problem is that um, the recursive calls are made on subproblems um, that have a ton of uh, overlap in them, right? And that is very nicely illustrated in this tree here. So let's say we make a call to f with the input n equals 5. Now, since we are not at the base case, f of 5 breaks down into f of 4 and f of 3. Right? So, so it's this part, the sum of the previous two Fibonacci numbers. And f of 4 breaks down into f of 3 plus f of 2. On this side, f of 3 breaks down into f of 2 plus f of 1. Here, f of 3 breaks down into f of 2 and f of 1 and so on. And then this f of 2 breaks down into f of 1 and f of 0. But these guys hit the base case because n is 1 here, n is 0 here. So this evaluates to 1, this evaluates to 1. So 1 plus 1 is 2, which is the value of this guy, which is returned to its caller here. And then on this side, f of 1 is again the base case. So its value is 1. And that is uh, added to this guy here. So we have a 3 up here and uh, so on and so on and so on right and so and and at the end once the 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 function is done we have the correct value uh, uh, we have uh, f of 5 as 8 which is what we want uh, there's actually a little uh, mistake that i made here which is this thing should be a f 5 and this should be a 6 right so the fifth fibonacci number is 8 and the function correctly calculates f of 5 as 8. But the problem, as you can see, by just looking at the colors of these nodes, is that there's a lot of overlap. So f of 3 is uh, calculated here. It's calculated again here. And then f of 2 is calculated once here. It's calculated here and here. Okay. And then f of 1 is calculated at all these places. So as you can see, even with the small example where n is just 5, there is a lot of overlap in the subproblems, right? And as n gets uh, uh, larger, you have uh, just too much overlap, and that seriously affects the performance of this function. So it turns out that this function, the way it is written here, is actually uh, exponential. And we can do a lot better than that uh, by seeking a non-recursive solution, right? So this is an example of a, uh, of a bad uh, recursive solution. Though it's not uh, obvious right away as to why it is bad. But once you draw a tree like this, it becomes immediately obvious. Okay, now when you write 
uh, a Java program as a library of static methods, it's always a good idea to include what is called a test client or, uh, uh, in, in that library. And the way you do that is by including a main method, all right? And the goal of that main method uh, is to test the implementation of all the, the static methods that make up that library, all right? So it's always a good practice to include a test client inside uh, a library of static methods. Now, we're going to be using static methods from four different kinds of uh, libraries. So we will use the standard system libraries that are part of the java.lang package. So for example, math is inside of this uh, package. Um, we will use um, uh, imported system libraries such as uh, java.util.arrays. Now, the, the standard system libraries need not be imported. So in Java, everything that sits inside of java.lang uh, comes for free. So you really don't have to import anything inside of lang. Uh, now math sits inside of lang, but you don't have to import it for the same reason. Okay. Um, but anything that is outside of java.lang, you have to explicitly import. Okay. And we will make use of some uh, such imported libraries, for example, java.util.arrays. And then we will make use of other libraries in uh, the text. And we will also make use of this package from the text, right? We'll make heavy use of the libraries inside of this package. Now let's talk about uh, application programming interface or API for short. Um, so an API simply lists uh, the library name and the, the return type signature and short descriptions of each of the methods. So it's basically a concise way of documenting a library. Okay, that's what an API is. Um, now, a client is a program that calls a method in another library, right? Um, and we will look at many client programs later on. And an implementation is basically uh, the Java code that implements the methods in an API, all right? Um, so you have three things here. You have an API, which is basically the documentation for a library that lists the, uh, the names and signatures and uh, return types of methods uh, along with the short description uh, for all of the methods in the library. And then a client program is a program that makes use of uh, methods from a library to solve some interesting problem. And then the implementation of an API is simply Java code that implements the, all the methods in uh, that library, all right? Now, Let's look at uh, the APIs for uh, some uh, uh, libraries. So let's, let's first consider a, a system library, java.lang.math. So math is what you would use for math-related uh, uh, functions, right? So for example, here what I'm showing you are some of the methods. This is not exhaustive, it's just some of the methods from the math library. Uh, so you have uh, a function called uh, max that takes two doubles, A and B as arguments, and returns the maximum of the two. You have a function called sine that takes an angle uh, uh, theta in radians as an argument and returns the sine of that angle, right? And then you have a function called random that uh, doesn't take any argument uh, but uh, returns uh, a random number, a random real number between zero and one, where zero is inclusive and one is not, right? And then you also have access to the, the celebrated constants. You have Euler's constant E, which you can access by saying math.e, and you have pi, which you can access by saying math.pi, right? Um, okay, so that's, that's an example of an API uh, and it's the API for the math library from the java.lang package, all right? Uh, and since it's part of java.lang, as I said before, you, you don't really need to import math if you want to use it. And uh, the way you use anything inside of this method uh, is by saying, uh, any, anything inside of this library is by saying the library name, which is math in this case, and then dot the name of the method or the, the constant, okay? So if it is a method, then you need to specify the arguments uh, that are part of the method. 
or if you want just these constants, you just specify the constant name. Okay. Here is another example of an API, and this is the, uh, the API for an imported system library called Arrays that sits inside of the java.util package. So to use this, you need to import uh, the library, all right? Um, so Arrays has several methods um, in it. So I'm just showing you one, which is called sort. So sort here takes an array, a one-dimensional array A of type integer, and it simply sorts it in place. It doesn't return a value. The return type is void, all right? But it has a side effect in that once the call is done, the elements of A are all sorted, okay? And uh, again, the way you call this method, since it's static, is by saying arrays dot sort and then the, uh, the, the argument. Right, which in this case is, is an array of integers. Um, so some more examples of APIs. So here uh, I'm showing you uh, the API for the standard libraries from the text. The first one is the API for STD random, which is a library that you could use for working with random numbers. Right? So it's a very rich library. Uh, Let's look at a couple of the methods. Uh, this method here, uniform, takes an argument, an integer n, and it returns an integer picked uniformly at random from the range 0 through n, where n is exclusive, but 0 is inclusive. Um, this method here, Bernoulli, takes a double p as an argument, and it returns true, it returns a Boolean, it returns true with probability p and false with probability 1 minus p. So you could use this method, for example, to model a coin flip. So if you were modeling a fair coin, you would make a, a call to Bernoulli with the argument 0 0.5, in which case the method will return true with probability a half and false with the probability half. Okay. Um, okay, and then here is another library um, from this package from our text. It's called std stats. And you could use this library to do basic statistics. And in fact, you, you will be using this in uh, 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 library a lot, all right? Um, okay, and it has, uh, again, a very rich uh, uh, set of functions. So um, th this function here, max, takes an array of doubles as an argument and returns the maximum element in the array. And then this method here takes an array of doubles as an argument and returns the average of those uh, values, right? And then this guy returns the standard deviation of those values and so on and so on and so on. So you could do some basic statistics using this uh, uh, library. Now let's talk about strings in Java. So a string is a sequence of characters or char values. So each element in the string is of type char. A string literal is a sequence of characters within double quotes, such as hello world embedded inside of double quotes, right? So that is a string literal, uh, meaning it is an expression and it has the type string, right? Now, um, strings in Java are really objects, right? So keep that in mind. They're not primitive uh, entities, they're objects. And yet, you know, you can take two strings and you can add them, so to speak. So uh, using the plus operator. So I could do something like uh, uh, Alice plus uh, the string Bob. Okay, so the two operands are strings. I'm adding them. Uh, using this plus operator, and the end result is that of concatenation. So this is going to give me a new string, which is Alice space Bob. All right. Now, what if you want to turn strings into primitive types? Um, <clears throat> Well, you could use the library, uh, library functions parseInt from integer and parse double from double, 
to turn a string to either an integer or to a double. Right? So these are the functions that you would use to, to convert strings to, to primitives. And what if you, and this is something that you do when, um, when you're uh, receiving inputs inside of a program. So for example, command line arguments that we will talk about later are all strings. And inside of the program, if you want to treat them as primitives, these are the methods that you would use to convert the strings into primitives. What about turning primitives into strings? Well, you could use the plus operator, all right? Um, so for example, I could say something like um, Alice plus the number 42. So in this case, Alice is a string and 42 is, an, uh, is a number, but what Java will do is it will automatically promote this into a string, all right? And the end result is going to be a string, Alice followed by 42, okay? So you can turn primitives into strings using uh, the plus operator. And, and, and Java will automatically turn the primitive into strings and do the right thing. Okay, so as uh, the last part of this lecture, I want to talk about input and output. Um, and the way to look about uh, to, to, to look at it as as follows. So you have some Java program p dot Java, and it receives some input, and it produces some output. And a program is is useless if it doesn't respond to user input, um, and if it doesn't produce any meaningful output. Now, in this course, we are going to consider different types of input and output. For input types, we are going to look at command line arguments, and we're going to then look at standard input and also file input, All right? So in this lecture, we'll focus on command line arguments and standard input, and we'll save file input for the following lecture. And for output types, we're going to consider standard output, meaning writing to the screen, and also writing to a file. Again, in this lecture, we'll only focus on standard output and we'll save file output for the following lecture. So what are command line arguments? So command line arguments are the arguments uh, that you list right after the program name when you run the program. So when you say Java P followed by all these arguments uh, uh, right next to the program name, these are what we call command line arguments. All right, these are basically command line inputs to the program P. This is the first input, second input, and so on, all the way up to the nth input. Now the question is, how do you access all these values inside of P? Well, um, so if you have a main method inside of P, well, then it definitely has a, a, a parameter, uh, args, uh, which is an array of strings. And it is that array that stores all these values. So if you want to get hold of this argument, you would say args at zero. If you want to get hold of the second argument, you would say args at one. And if you want to get hold of the nth argument, you would say args at n minus one, right? So it is via the, the argument of main that you get hold of all the command line arguments as strings, okay? So let's take a quick example. So here we have a program called useArgument um, that has uh, just one method, the, the entry point method main, right? And this is the array called args that receives the command line arguments, okay? What are we doing in this method? Well, we first print the string literal high without a new line character at the end, which is what print does. And then what we do is we print the first command line argument, which we get by saying args at zero and we print that out right after high, and we print this guy also without a new line character. And finally, we print the string literal, how are you, with a new line character at the end, right? So, um, <clears throat> so, what we, uh, so the way this program works is, it receives some user input as a command line argument, and it sticks the, 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 uh, the first command line argument between two string literals in, uh, in the output, okay? So here is how you know, the, the, the output would look like. So if I run uh, use argument by saying Java use argument, giving it a command line argument Alice, then the program responds by saying hi, comma, space, 
Alice. So this part of the output comes from this statement. The Alice comes from this statement, okay, where we print the first command line argument. And then this part comes from this line here. And since this part was printed with a new line character, the prompt shows up on a new line, right? And then I run the same program again, but now with a command line argument, Bob. And the program responds by saying, hi, Bob, how are you? Right? So this is now a, a, a data-driven program. The, the, uh, the, uh, the program receives some input from the, the user. And it's, it's quite nice because, you know, uh, you don't really have to modify the program uh, just because you want to greet a different person. Okay? Uh, it's the same program that you could use to greet any uh, user. Right? Um, so, so that's a, a command line argument. So it's one uh, a form of input to a program. Now, command line arguments uh, have their limitations. Uh, it's, it's quite tedious, uh, for one, to specify these arguments right next to the, the program name. Um, and um, if, if you are writing a program that's supposed to deal with arbitrary amounts of input, then command line is not what you want to consider. Uh, and if you don't know in advance how much input you're going to receive, again, command line uh, arguments are not going to be of any help. So for that, we have to go uh, beyond and we have to look at other forms of input. Okay. Uh, but before we get to that, let's first talk about standard output. Um, so standard output is basically writing to the screen or the terminal. And the way we are going to do that is using this library std out that sits inside of this package uh, from the authors of our text. And this uh, library supports several functions and I'm just showing you uh, a couple. Uh, printLN uh, simply takes a string and prints it out to the screen. And LN means uh, print a new line after printing the string, right? And there is another method called printf that does formatted printing. So uh, the first argument to printf is the format specifier or the format string, and then you list the values that you want to print according to the format given by the format specifier. Right? So let's look at uh, uh, some example. So here we have a program called random sequence. Uh, uh, we first import these uh, uh, two libraries, std out, which is this guy here, and std random that we talked about before. And what this program um, uh, does is it receives three command line arguments. Okay, uh, the first one as an integer, so argz0 is the first command line argument which we turn into an integer using this library method. So that's that. And then we receive two more command line arguments, low and high as doubles. So the second and the third command line arguments are turned into doubles using the parse double method and they are assigned to variables low and high. And then what we do is we use a for loop to print um, n random numbers from the range low to high. Okay? And the way we get a random number from that range is using the uniform method from this std random library. All right? So this guy simply returns uh, a double from the range low to high and that we assign to x. And once we have that random value, we print it out using the formatted uh, print function. So the first argument is the format specifier, right? And this says that I want to print this value x using this particular format. So the percent sign is, is part of the syntax, okay? So percent means this is a, really a placeholder that gets replaced by this value according to this rule. So what is the rule? The rule says I want this number printed with just two decimal places, all right? And F stands for floating point number. So, so X will be printed just with two decimal places, all right? Um, and then we do this N times because we want N random numbers uh, uh, printed and each from the range low to high. So here's how the output is going to look like. If I run the program random sequence with n equals two, low equals 100, 
high equals 200, the program comes back with two numbers, two random numbers from the range 100 to 200. Okay, And notice that each one is printed only after two decimal places. And that comes from this rule here, this formatted printing. All right. Um, now, when, when you use formatted printing, you can print any number of values. If you have uh, five values that you're trying to print, you need to have you know, five, uh, 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 like five of these placeholders, five percent signs, and then uh, a rule following that. All right, so just keep that in mind. Um, okay, so that's that. Now let's talk about uh, standard input. So as I said before, command line arguments have uh, a limitation. Um, and when you're dealing with uh, you know, arbitrary amounts of input, or if you just don't know how much input you're going to receive, then you, you have to go uh, uh, beyond command line argument and look at something uh, like standard input, right? So for standard input, we are going to use this library stdn that sits inside of this package given to us by the authors of our text. And here are some of the functions from that library. All right? um, you could use isempty to tell whether or not the, uh, the standard input stream is uh, empty or not. So it returns true when there is nothing left to be read and it returns false otherwise. And then you can read an integer from the standard input stream using this method here. Uh, you can read a double, you can read a boolean, and you can read a char using this method. All right. Um, and they're all static methods, so the way you call them is by saying, as usual, stdn dot the method name. Okay. So let's look at an example where we make use of this library. So this program is uh, called average, and what it does is it processes uh, an arbitrary number of double values from standard input, and it computes and prints their average. So we just don't know in advance how many uh, inputs we are going to receive. Uh, um, and regardless of the number of inputs that the program receives, it uh, averages them out and prints the result. Right? That's that's how the program works. So let's see how it's implemented. Uh, so we initialize a couple of variables, count to keep track of the number of uh, inputs that we receive, and then sum to keep track of the sum of the numbers. Right? And then we have this while loop where we make uh, a call to a method from this library. So we say while not stdin dot is empty, meaning if there is uh, something to be read from the standard input, then do the stuff which is given in the body of the while loop. All right. Um, okay. So if there is something to be read, what we do here is we read a double using the read double method, and that is assigned to value, and we simply increment sum by value. All right. So we read a new value from standard input and add it or accumulate it in sum. And since we read a, a, a number from standard input, we increment count by one. So count simply keeps track of how many numbers we have processed so far. Okay, And then we go and check again if there is something more to be read from standard input. If so, we read it, add it to sum, increment count by one. And we go and check again, and so on, and so on, and so on. Okay, So this call is empty, is going to return uh, true precisely when the input stream sees the end of file character. An end of file is typically denoted, uh, so end of file is typically denoted by control D on Unix-like systems. And it is control Z on Windows-like systems. All right. So whenever you hit the, the control D uh, or control Z uh, key combination on the terminal, that's what sends the end of file signal to the program. Right. And when uh, when the input stream has the end of file, std in dot is empty returns true, and not of true is false, and you're out of the while loop. What do you do in that case? Well, in that case, we calculate the average as the sum divided by the total number of numbers, which is count. 
and then we simply print average out. All right. So let's see how the program works. So if you run uh, average by saying Java average, then the program simply waits for input. Right? And what you do is you can manually type or interactively type inputs. You can type in the numbers 1 followed by space and then 2, space 3, space 4, space 5 and so on. And then uh, if those are the only numbers that you want to calculate the average for, you send the end of file signal, control D. Right? And when you do that, the program comes back with the average, which is 3 in this case. Right? So you can feed in interactively any number of numbers and then send the, the end of file signal at the very end and calculate the, uh, the, the average. Okay? Um, so that's how standard input uh, works. Uh, you're able to deal with arbitrary amounts of data. Right? Now, feeding a program interactively, um, uh, uh, feeding input to a program interactively is, very, uh, is fairly tedious. Um, so what if you want to calculate the average of a thousand numbers uh, and you want to do that many, many times? You don't want to sit there and type these thousand numbers each time. So what you want to do instead is store those input numbers in some file and somehow feed that file as input to the program. Okay? So that's what we're going to talk about next. Um, so um, there is something called output redirection that helps in redirecting the output, the standard output of a program into a file, right? And the way you do that is by using the greater than sign. So here I'm running a random sequence, a program that we talked about before, with the inputs n equals 1000, low equals 100, and high equals 200. So this guy is going to, uh, to print a thousand random numbers picked from the range 100 to 200. But since we have this greater than sign, it's really not going to print the stuff, the output to the screen. Instead, all the output is going to be redirected to a file that you specify after the greater than sign. You can call this whatever you want, and that's the file will store the output from this program. All right. Um, and once this is done, I can inspect data.txt using the head command from, uh, from Unix. And look at the top five lines, for example. And what I see are these numbers. And they are all you know, from the range 100 through 200, as you may expect. OK, um, okay so now this file data.txt has a 1,000 random numbers uh, in it. Now, what if I want to use that file as an input to my average program? Well, I could make use of the input redirection uh, concept. Okay. So I can say Java average less than sign. So that is input redirection sign. And then specify the name of the, uh, the, the input file, which is data.txt. Okay. And what does average do? Well, it simply calculates the average of all the numbers that are sitting inside of data.txt. And it prints that average up. Okay. Now, average doesn't even know that you are doing this business with redirection. It simply assumes that it's getting its input from standard input, all right? Um, and even in this case, when you're uh, uh, sending a file to the program using the less than uh, redirection operator, um, there is uh, an end of file signal that is sent at the very end because every file, you know, uh, every file, Every file on your file system ends with the end of file character, right? So even data.txt has that end of file character at the very end. So, so when you run average, uh, uh, giving it this file as input, um, average will simply go through all the numbers in this file, all the thousand random numbers, average them out, and then it stops when it sees the end of file signal. And that's when it prints, it computes and prints the average value. All right? And the, uh, so the last bit is that of piping. So what you can do using the piping operator is take the standard output from one program and make it the standard input of another program. 
So what I did here in two steps uh, can be done in one step. All right. So I can completely avoid creating this intermediate data.txt file. So I can take the output of random sequence, uh, a thousand numbers, uh, a thousand random numbers from the range 100 to 200, and simply uh, pipe it as input, as standard input to the program average. Right? And then average simply comes back with the average of those thousand numbers. That's what you see here. Okay? So here we have completely bypassed uh, uh, the, the data.txt file. Right? We really don't need it. Now, uh, I must say that you can have any number of commands chained using the pipe uh, operator. Uh, so you could do, so on the command prompt, you can say command one, pipe, command two, pipe, command three, pipe, and so on and so on and so on. And the way this works is the standard output of command one becomes the standard input of command two, standard output of command two becomes the standard input of command three, and so on and so on and so on, right? And then at the end, you can send it to, let's say, command n. And if you want the output of this last command saved to a file, you can say, save it to some file, data.txt. Okay, so these are fairly uh, important uh, 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 ideas. Okay, so that's the uh, end of this lecture uh, on uh, the programming model. Thank you.